recite some uh, Jesus. verbal information about Jesus, uh, about Alan Kersall and his contribution to Pyro Shop. Uh, it goes back to uh, uh, when I uh, retired from Rockwell and uh, went to work for JPL, and uh, they had a uh, contract to write a mill handbook to improve instrumentation uh, with uh, some very some uh, previous history uh, that the Aerospace Corporation had with uh, working with major laboratories and uh, the kind of, uh, of variability they got in uh, results from a bunch of uh, large pistol laboratories, uh, pistol laboratories like uh, uh, Northrop Grumman and Boeing and whatever. I mean, we're not talking about little hole to wall laboratories. Anyway, they're uh, when they uh, decided to try to uh, get all of the uh, uh, people to work on the same piece of data, they made it taped up, and made up 20 copies and sent them to roughly 20 organizations. And uh, the results was when they got back to compare the, eventually the spectra, okay, there was an order magnitude variation. So then when the Air Force decided that they were, what they needed was a mill handbook, so at least there were some recommended procedures to follow. And uh, uh, I went to work for a guy by the name of Dennis Kern, who some of you know, at JPL, and, uh, and uh, he asked me if, uh, if I would uh, assume the uh, task management, and I said, only under one condition. He said, what's that? I said that I get to uh, use Alan Pearsall to do a lot of the work. So that's how Alan got involved in this. Anyway, I wrote the first three chapters of this handbook. Alan uh, wrote the last two, the big ones, okay? And two uh, appendices, one on pyroshock and the other one on non-stationary random analysis, uh, both of which I think even today are in, uh, in pretty good shape. Uh, I thought I would uh, give you a little bit of the background in, uh, in how uh, uh, we got to the stage of, uh, of uh, what to use for pyroshock validation. And uh, uh, there was a, a test program at, going on at the time at McDonnell Douglas in Huntington Beach by a guy by the name of Dan Powers, some of who you old timers may recognize. And he had, by far at the time, the best database, and he was basically the nationally uh, uh, focal point for, uh, for pyroshock data. And, uh, but uh, uh, Dan had a problem. Uh, he loved to collect data, and he had notebooks full, but he never liked to like papers. So very little of this got published. Anyway, uh, uh, Powers, uh, uh, needed some ideas as to how to validate pyroshock data, and he found out that Navy already had a procedure in the lower frequency range for shock data and decided to use that same procedure for pyroshock. And uh, uh, so the basic ideas for this came from two guys. Okay, one is Howie Gaberson, who uh, Vesta uh, uh, now teaches short courses with, very experienced uh, guy in uh, naval shock work. And the other one was a guy by the uh, name of Dick Shamans, who was very big in, uh, in all sorts of data analysis, and worked, on, worked for the Navy uh, down in San Diego. So they put this procedure together, which was pretty simple. First of all, if you, if you could, you should uh, have your, uh, eventually your shocks, uh, shock response spectrum decreasing at roughly, uh, if you, you made your measurements in acceleration, uh, you should have a drop off in your uh, spectrum down to low frequencies. The only thing that often interfered was that, was that if you happen to be using a, uh, a uh, uh, piezoelectric accelerometer coupled to a charge amplifier, there's often a that, was, that combination was often, often the cause for what was called zero shift, which mainly influenced the low frequencies. And so one of the criteria was 
is to do your best to reduce uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the effect of zero shift. And uh, the, that issue went on for, I guess, almost two decades. And uh, finally, uh, uh, Dave uh, put me onto this. He said, the first time I started to make pyro shock measurements with uh, piezo-resistive accelerometers, boy, did we get rid of the zero shift fast. And uh, so uh, that's now the standard. And for those people that are currently using piezoelectric accelerometers uh, coupled, to, uh, uh, coupled to charge amplifiers, Use them for your vibration tests, but don't use them for your pyro shock test. You're going to have this con consistent problem at low frequencies. The other thing that uh, that uh, that uh, uh, Gaberson and uh, Chalmers came up with, that was subsequently transferred to pyro shock, was to look at the shock response spectrum in terms of the positive spectrum and the negative spectrum. And if you go and look at, uh, say, the Shock and Vibration Handbook, why well, you will have that separately described in the appropriate chapter. I've got the chapter now in the, uh, in the handbook. But, uh, uh, but uh, take a look at those uh, two spectra and see that they lay pretty well on top of each other. It's not a perfect layout, but it'll certainly encourage you. The other thing to, to do is, uh, and this is where, uh, uh, where uh, zero shift comes in, uh, uh, and this is pointed out in Pearsall's uh, Appendix A uh, for the IST handbook. That was the follow-on of the uh, military handbook. Uh, and uh, and uh, anyway, uh, uh, avoid, uh, avoid the zero shift at all costs, and you get your rid, rid of all sorts of problems. Um, the other thing that was a little interesting is this thing started out as a mill handbook. And so uh, Pearsall and uh, I and a couple of other guys uh, submitted it. It was 350 pages. And so uh, this uh, was a contract with the, with the Air Force, technically monitored by the Aerospace Corporation. But the document eventually went to an office of the Space Division of the Air Force. And uh, it ended up in the hands of a colonel. And the colonel uh, looked at this uh, document, and he was very perplexed. He said, he said, I'm not sure whether we're going to publish this at all. And after three months, it still hadn't been published. We found out that there was a, uh, an edict sent down from uh, uh, the uh, Department of Defense. In fact, uh, there was uh, something called the uh, called the Perry Commission, uh, uh, started by Bill Perry, who's still active, by the way, and Kerbin work. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, Perry uh, had an edict. Mill, mill requirements are bad. Cots is good. And the reason he came to that conclusion is that there was the famous stainless steel toilet seat on the C-5 uh, aircraft. <laughs> Uh, that had to be subjected to all of these mill requirements. Everything in, uh, in, uh, in I guess, uh, 810. And it had to pass all of these requirements. Well, Perry thought that was pretty ridiculous, and I don't think there was many <laughs> practical people that argued with that. But anyway, that's where the transition was made. But all of these guys in the Air Force didn't know what to do. Even today, things like mill standard 1540, which is used for, in the aerospace, uh, business uh, and as a basic requirement uh, for anything uh, launched under, uh, under the Air Force auspices, uh, they, uh, the, um, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, latest version is not a mill standard, it is a recommended practice, which gives you the opportunity to go, and go into the, uh, uh, into the, uh, uh, into uh, the uh, program office and argue your way out of several requirements. And I can tell you there's a lot of program offices that didn't want to hear that. So this is the constant conflict currently going on. Anyway, so that's where Pearsall made his major contribution into pyroshock. One of the things I forgot to mention, the zero shift also